Yes, my wife uh, reminded me the other day that it was only 50 years ago, almost the day when we both started Glasgow University, <coughs> and uh, Morgan was uh, te uh, teaching uh, Scottish literature, um, uh, Sc Scottish poetry, modern Scottish poetry, so I've been listening to his voice, and that's a danger. Having listened to it for such a long time, I've become like a, a mad uh, ancient mariner figure, just going on endlessly. So I will promise to stop talking when the big hand is pointing to three and the little hand is pointing to four. Okay, I'll just stop. Right, this was a puzzle. What was there to do uh, today? Half an hour, six poems, National Five. It's not really worth going through line by line and maybe that is not what you want because it's been done well elsewhere. I had to try to imagine what it was that you might need. And of course that's difficult too because you've got very experienced teachers here who will have taught some of the poems on the set list for years and years and know them very, very well. And they'll be wondering, what are the other poems doing there? What am I supposed to do with this thing, Slate or Winter? Who chose these? Why are they there? How do they cohere? And they don't. That was my thought immediately, but they do. Uh, the younger ones might be... <laughs> The, the younger ones might be saying, well, how can I get a handle on this? What, I didn't study them at school or I didn't study them at university. This is important. I don't feel I have the background. So I'm trying to do two things. First of all, I wrote an uh, 8,000 word lecture. Put that away. Okay, it'll be online next week, early next week. I left, left it off. I'll add anything that anybody wants to ask me or whatever. Uh, the lecture is now... One post it, two post it. Um, and that's what we'll speak to. But luckily we have other things. We have the new selected poems from which all the poems, the chosen poems, the set text come. And that's good and it's fairly cheap and it's fairly accessible and I'll use that. There is this, uh, if you want, um, a broader introduction to the background but still accessible, the poetry of Edwin Morgan. Um, which I, I wrote and was uh, stupidly pleased when I'd finished it and, and put some things into a kind of word count uh, which assesses readability and it came out as what I was aiming for, 16 years and two months. <laughs> so it's meant to be for children, very, very clear, very sensible, but it's, but it's pretty full. Oh, I've got that. Um, we also have this um, book which is a wonderful book I, I think I, I find it very very helpful indeed um, what I especially liked about it was the use of cooperative and interactive learning techniques so you can just see the lessons the suggestions for lessons unfolding and it, it, they will work so that is fine now I'll find you'll find that I, I'll, I'll have, have some quarrels with some of the interpretations here and with some of the interpretations in my own work so that's all right <laughs> Um, the other thing which I, which I, I have is the selected correspondence of Edward Morgan, which is good and recent. It's got nice little, um, it's got his words, that, that's the essential thing. The money from this goes, the royalties go to the Edward Morgan Trust, which then gives it away. You remember that you left not only a million pounds to the SNP, but a million pounds to young Scottish poets. Okay, so I'm in the business of giving away that million pounds and it keeps getting added to by his royalties and royalties like this. So what should we do? What should we do? Uh, what did I say we do? Yeah. Um, I want to give a little bit about exam technique because I think if this is new for at least some of you, especially that final, um, the final question, you'll want to know how do I do that? How do, there are so many marks going for this. How will I deal with it? Um, you want to look at the poems themselves. But above all, you want to think, how am I going to engage children with this? What kind of activities or entry points can I find in these poems, given that I have to deal with all of them, that will really help um, Edward Morgan replace a uh, knock from his perch, uh, Norman McCaig, <laughs> which, which I would like to see. Okay. Um, so I want to explore the poems and link them to the exam questions and it seems to me that the, the three key themes which will take you into all of these poems not, and interconnection between them. 
One is the idea of journeys in space and time, or space-time, which is another thing altogether. The other is the theme of isolation and solidarity, the isolated person in the city seeking solidarity, a social so solidarity that he's looking for. And the last big theme is voices for Scotland, not a voice for Scotland, not a political a voice for Scotland, and I know it's my voice, it's voices for Scotland, different voices, a variety, a strange and fascinating variety of voices. So we'll start with that journey in space and time, or space-time. Um, Edwin Morgan was growing up in the, born in 1920, he was growing up through the, the, the 1920s, where of course he was aware, because he was a smart wee guy, of the theory of relativity and how that was actually changing the way that people thought about time and light and the relationship of the kind of world that we lived in to the universe which was out there. And that time was not a, a, a linear thing, but it seemed to bend. And he was also fascinated by something he came across in his teens, a book called An Experiment in Time by a man called Joseph Dunn. It's a fascinating book, came out in 1927 and an expanded edition in 1934. And it deals with precognition and how it is that some people have dreams that tell the future. Or how is it that synchronicity happens? That so you're doing something and then suddenly, for example, the very person you're talking about comes around the corner. Or you've read about something and you see it the next day. Now, Joseph Dunn explores that and he comes up with a strange idea, which I think was actually influential on Morgan. It sounds crazy, but he was actually a military man, a military engineer. He's full of equations and all that sort of thing. But the idea was that there were parallel universes to us, which we can tap into through dreams. And these parallel universes are behind us, as it were, and therefore they have a wider focus of vision to us. We only see this, what's right in front of us. These personages, intelligences behind us, see further back and further front. And somehow in our dream state, we can tap into that. And occasionally, and he did various experiments and he's got various, uh, uh, various interesting coincidences. He, uh, you know, he argues that this is the case. Now that's important for Morgan for various reasons, particularly space poems, but beyond that as well. For example, you can look at In the Snack Bell as an aspect of time, not just about caring for an individual who's handicapped, who's uh, trying to overcome tremendous physical difficulties, but actually looking at the poem in the way that it, it makes time behave. It starts in the present tense, it runs all through the present tense, and we know what the situation is. The old man comes up, he's hunchback, I want to go to the toilet. And the only person in the place to help him is the poet. And so they go downstairs to the toilet and he helps them. Now what's interesting is the way that the time seems to slow and bend in this, in the second version of it. A few yards of floor are like a landscape to be negotiated. In the slow setting out, time has almost stopped. I concentrate my life to his crunch of spilt sugar, slidey puddle from the night's umbrella. And the slowness of time is conveyed partly by the syntax, the way that he uses thematic variation, varying the first thing that you notice in the sentence, the first thing presented, that's the theme of the sentence, and slowly we go down, and slowly we go down. Not, and we go down slowly, that would be the normal thing, but and slowly we go down, or inch by inch we do this. So that time is slowing down remarkably here. And then, this is the crunch point, I think, within the poem. When the old man has been to the toilet and Edwin Morgan's helped him to button up his clothes and helped him to wash his hands, he comes up and suddenly the sign shifts remarkably and it shifts back through the past, not only through the days of this man's life, who's been born like this, but into the past of human beings who have climbed and climbed despite all sorts of difficulties. He climbs, and steadily enough, he climbs, we climb, 
He climbs with many pauses, but with that one persisting patience of the undefeated, which is the nature of man when all is said. And slowly we go up, and slowly we go up. The faltering, unfaltering steps take him at last to the door. Now, that idea of time suddenly opening up and seeing the progress which has brought human beings to this place, enacted through the struggle of a man who's tremendously handicapped, I think that is the poetic heart of the poem. Now, there's all sorts of other technical things happening, and a book like this, this one is, is wonderful on that. It made me think, I don't need to be worried about physics teachers thinking that they've got a body of knowledge to teach, and English teachers just make it up as they go along. There's a tremendous, tremendous amount of technical, technical knowledge there which we can teach children about, you know, alliteration, about the way that syntax alters meaning, about how atmosphere is created, onomatopoeic alliteration and so on. All of these things are good. If you want, and sometimes this is another thing, so I'll get out of the way, if the children want something cheap and cheerful, although then I'm sure at enormous expense, they can go to BBC Bite Size. If you want to see what a Corporation Glasgow bus looks like in 1961, there's a wee picture. It was black <laughs> and white. If you want to see what the lights look like in Buchanan Street for Trio in 1963, they were grey as well, with wee bits of white on them. So that's very basic. It's fine. It, you know, it, it, it does its job, and I especially like the multiple choice questions. I've become a fan of multiple choice questions just to see what people have know or what they've forgotten. It's sometimes surprising what the children haven't taken in. So that is fine. What I didn't agree with on this was where they take the last, ex what I call an explicit, expletive in the poem, Dear Christ to be born for this, which the poet sees as the man gets on the bus. And uh, Willie Maguire, who is a former student, excellent colleague, a uh, very good person, he reads this back as a kind of Christian message somehow in the poem that the Edmund Morden becomes like Simon of Cyrene helping the old man with his cross and so on. It's a wee bit awkward. He goes downstairs, rather climbing Calvary, to go down and back up. And I think there's something else that's going there. I think there's something more ancient and pagan. But that's not to say that Morgan wasn't interested in Christianity. He was tremendously so. He was tremendously interested in it. It puzzled him. And that brings me on to the second kind of time that we should think about. And it's the old distinction between chronos and kairos. Now, chronos it, it, is in theology and philosophy. Chronos is linear time, chronological time, as hour follows hour and so on. Kairos is something different. It's the special time, the numinous time, the hour of decision. It's like when Jesus says to Mary at... Um, at uh, Cana. Woman, one, what is that to you or to me? My hour is not yet come. He's not checking his watch. He's not looking at his, his iPhone calendar. He's not talking about that hour. He's talking about another quality of hour. So that the Kairos time, this differently qualitative time, is really quite an important background to Morgan's Glasgow poems. For example, uh, we see it in Trio uh, very, very clearly because it's Christmas. And in some ways, this is a meditation on Christmas. But it's not a Christian meditation. It's a bit too easy to say, OK, these three uh, people have gifts and it's lovely and it's happy and so on. And they're like the Magi. They're coming and it's Christmas. And look, these lights over Buchanan Street, they're kind of like the star over Bethlehem. But that's not actually what the, the, the poem says. The poem is full of what you might call a pagan or a humanist, certainly, sensibility. Um, apart from the, the, the loveliness of it and the liveliness and the vitality and the, 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 the beauty of the baby in its white shawl, its bright eyes, its fresh sweet, sweet cake. If we look at the gifts, if we look at the images that most uh, uh, impact on us, we see that they're really quite, that looking back to a festivity which is much more ancient, much more pagan, the guitar swells out under its milky plastic cover, tied to the neck with silver tinsel tape and a brisk sprig of mistletoe. Orphean sprig, melting baby, warm chihuahua. The veil of tears is powerless before you. Whether Christ is born or is not born, you put paid to fate, it abdicates under the Christmas lights. Now, 
Again, a wonderful uh, aspect of this is the way that it gives homework activities, research activities for children, because they've got access to so much knowledge. So what is Orphean? Why the sprig? What's mistletoe? Why is it doing that? What's it doing there? Is it just a decoration or does it signify something else? And in a poem where you've got so little room to spare, everything means something. And so what's there is not a Christian message, but something which I think is actually more political. These people are like a little protest march of three. And what are they looking for? They're looking for freedom. They don't want to be taught or preached at by I am jolly. They don't like Scottish <laughs> religious aspects of Christmas. What they want is something more active against sterility, against what is monstrous, against what curtails human freedom. Monsters of the year go blank, are scattered back, can't bear this march of three. And so that, I think, is the key message. Now, it's an interesting thing to talk about with children. What is Christmas? What does it mean? What's the meaning here? What are these people? What do they represent? Good Friday is even more uh, remarkably pointed about uh, the Christmas, uh, sorry, about the Christian message. Good Friday, three o'clock, the bus lurches round into the sun. Does this go? He flops down beside me, right along Bass Street. Oh, that's, that, that's all right. See, and so he sits there and he talks. Now, the man talks about religious issues. And there's some debate as to whether he's a Catholic, since it's Scotland. Is he a Catholic or is he a, is he a Protestant? <laughs> the BBC Bite Size is convinced he's a Catholic. <laughs> Why? He's drunk. <laughs> he doesn't study it. Apologies, BBC website, especially if the, the writer of the BBC Bite Size uh, is here today. It's because he's kind of obsessed by religion, or perhaps it's because he's confessional. He, he, he doesn't know better. He talks about things. But I, I, I think that's uh, open to debate anyway. Um, so the man doesn't understand. And the key heart of the poem is the sense that he has, that he has been... <sighs> He's been destroyed, really, and he's been destroyed by a society which has not only taken away his religious knowledge, he doesn't know the difference between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. He doesn't know what it's for, and he says so. But he's trying to get it from this silent uh, passenger, a supposedly silent passenger. You're an educated man. You can tell me right, whether Christ was crucified or was he rose from the dead like. See what I mean? You're an educated man. You can tell me. Ah, oh, well, there you are. It's been seen time and again. The working man has no education. He just can't. just hasn't got it. No, I mean, he's just bloody ignorant. Christ died, bloody ignorant. Now, the excellent Scottish short text advises you not to treat this character as a sympathetic one. And they say it's possible to look on him as a sympathetic character, but really they're more sympathetic characters. If you get a question on sympathetic characters, don't choose him. <laughs> but I find myself, I find myself full of sympathy for this man. And I think this man has been really badly shortchanged, and he knows it. And what does he do? He drowns it out with drink. But of course, he doesn't spend all his money on drink. He's on his way to buy Easter eggs. So there we are. He's going to do something. Okay, it's a pagan thing. It's got Christian links rolling aside the stone uh, from the tomb. But um, that's been an appropriation, and the poet knows it, and we know it. But what speaks to us is the man in his own voice. Now, this actually was quite radical at the time, because um, these Glasgow poems had no fans among the people Edwin Morgan admired. Ian Hamilton Finlay, who was the, also the great experimental poet, the concrete poet of the 1960s, he thought these, compared with Edwin Morgan's concrete poetry, which was lively, sparkly, intelligent, witty, these were kind of flat, the vocabulary wasn't interesting, and so on, and he, he put them down. Hugh McDermott, whom Edwin Morgan admired tremendously, he was a great father figure for him, he hated Glasgow. For him, it was an arida nutrix. A dry nurse, not a wet nurse. There was no poetic nourishment in Glasgow, according to McDermott. And there was nothing in the Glasgow dialect that you could write poetry in. 
Now, Edwin Morgan is being quite uh, subversive here and quite bold and quite aggressive in his use of Glasgow speech, but not in the normal way that people say Glasgow people are aggressive. He's just being <coughs> radical. He's being radical in using it and seeing what can be done with it. Now, the final aspect of time that I want to deal with is the one that we all see on the, the, the faces of our loved ones and also ourselves occasionally. Well, you won't yet, but um, I can tell you it's true. We watch the passage of time on our own face and our own physique. And the poem Winter, which also has a Glasgow setting, is about that. You really have to read this poem, I think. You really have to read it through the poem which he'd written about seven years earlier, The Second Life, and which he gave as a title poem for his first collection, which he wrote when he was, um, which he was published when he was about 48, which is a long time for a poet. He was a slow beginner in terms of, of, of publication. And in The Second Life, he's looking in the early 60s at Glasgow, what's being done, they're tearing down the old buildings. It's, it's wonderful. There's a sense of change, there's positive political change. And he's in love. He's fallen in love with somebody that his parents would have disapproved of, not because he was a man, well, but because he was, he was a working class man, he was a Catholic, he worked in a store, he was a storesman, and he wouldn't have got a job in the family shipyard. They had a shipbreaking yard, Arnott, Young and Company, and they had a no Catholic um, policy there. So Edwin Morgan's been a wee bit subversive and, and uh, rebellious there as well. But he's living this wonderful sense of change. Ed, does every man feel like this at 40? I mean, it's like St. Thomas Wolfe's New York, his heady light, the stunning plunging canyons, beauty, pale stars winking, this hazy downtown quitting time. And he's looking out and he's watching the skaters on Bingham Pond off Great Western Road. All January, all February, the skaters enjoyed Bingham's Pond, the crisp cold evenings, they swung and flashed among car headlights, the drivers parked round the unlit pond to watch them and give them light. What laughter and pleasure rose in the rare lulls of the yards away stream of wheels along Great Western Road. Now, seven years later, what a change. Same situation, he's looking out the window of his flat uh, uh, over Great Western Road and he's looking out on a totally different and devastating scene. He's seven years older. He's actually had a, a quarrel with, uh, with John Scott that they never recovered from. He never saw him again before he died the following year. And he's feeling also his age, right? He's coming up um, for retirement, an age when he could retire. He's 57. He's fallen in love with a much younger man, so the, the gap between the, the age gap is really, really visible to him. And he's feeling, well, I don't know, embarrassed about it, but he, he knows he's, being, he's, living, he's working in dangerous uh, territory in a way. And he's doing his university work and he's presumably preparing lectures on Tennyson. And he comes across this poem, Tithonus, by Tennyson, which is about the, the myth of, of Tithonus, who <laughs> asked for the gift of eternal life but forgot, silly man, to ask for the gift of eternal youth. So he lives forever in a more and more decrepit body. And so Morgan is aware of this, that he's growing older. And he plays with Tennyson's words, which are the, the opening. The woods decay, the woods decay and fall. The vapours weep their burden to the ground. Man comes and tills the field and lies beneath. And after many a summer dies the swan. And he deliberately plays around and chops things down, almost as if he's destroying that poem by stopping and starting in the wrong places and altering the meaning. The year goes, he writes, the woods decay, and after, many a summer dies. The swan in Bingham's pond, a ghost comes and goes, it goes and ice appears, it holds, bear gulls that stand around surprised, blinking in the heavy light. But the comparison with the joyousness of Bingham Pond in the, in the early 60s is there to see. It's a dark scene and also a violent scene, I think. I find one stark scene cut by evening prize, by warring air. The muffled hiss of blades escapes into breath, hangs with it a moment, fades off. Okay, the, the, the blades of the, of, of the skates, but also the blades of Glasgow nightlife 
There's cries, there's violence there, and he's looking out. Worse than that, worse than that, he has lost his optimism. When he came to write or find a motto for his big uh, collected poems in 1990, he chose uh, a motto and didn't translate it from uh, Basque, ancient Basque. Betty zero urdin zati bat dago bila is azu. Which, if you go to Google Translate, you'll find it means always sky blue, fragment one is up there in the sky. There's always one rag of blue. Bila is azu. Search for it. Okay? Now, the longest line in that poem is lost the blue. The dearest blue is not there. Though poets would find it. If he can't find it, he's not a poet anymore. What's the point of his life? This was his identity. So that is a, a really, really sort of sad poem. And you find that whereas before the car headlights were, were uh, lighting up this, the, the scene for the skaters, and it's a beautiful, friendly, coherent, cohesive social scene, now what's driving down the road is the fog. It's the fog and it's driving west. It's heading west out towards the sunset. So but to let children look at the comparison, compare those two scenes, what's the difference? What's going on? Um, why, what's the mood? And how is that mood created? Apart from looking at the tithiness stuff. Now that leads on to the second thing, and obviously I've taken too much time with that, but it's really the important uh, one. And that is the idea of the isolation versus the solidarity or the search for solidarity. The poet is there and he's looking out and he's cut off, he's an outsider. And so often in Morgan's poem, we see him on the outside of the crowd. He's looking in. It's as if he's taking a picture in an Instamatic or an Instagram. And he's there and he's part of it, but he's not part of it. Maybe the artist always has to be like that. But that sense of isolation is really, really powerful in that poem. Um, and of course, the, the isolation and isolated people um, allows you to think of the other poems in relation to that as well. The sense of solidarity which there is in Trio, the sense of the, the, the poet not being part of that crowd, just one among many shoppers. There's a, there's a sense of isolation of, 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 of the old man, the old hunchback man. And it's the two loners in that cafe who get together. Because Edmund Morgan isn't with anybody else as far as we know. So there's that sense of the, the, the lone person who oddly enough becomes the only one, the atheist person, the only one to help in that situation. Right, there's another loner as well, and that leads us, which is the hyena, and that leads us on to the, the last big theme, which is the idea of voices for Scotland. Now, a poet like Norm McCaig is easy to understand because he has one voice. So has Seamus Heaney. They're instantly recognisable. Caroline Duffy as well, they've got a style. Edwin Morgan jumps from one style to another, from one form to another, one genre to another, one, uh, one perspective to another. And he was deliberately doing this in order to introduce to Scottish literature aspects which he felt McDermott had closed down. Not only about Glasgow speech, there's a voice for one of the Scotland's voices which hadn't been heard before, but the voices of machines, the computer's first Christmas card, and its second Christmas card, and its code poem, and its dialect poem, strange creatures, Loch Ness Monster song, things in the world, and Apple's song. He spoke constantly through other people's voices, space explorers, people from Mars. So he was very, very interested in that. And the hyena is an excellent example of him being enabled to, uh, enabling us to see what it is like, or to hear rather, what another voice is like. It's a very interesting uh, poem. It was commissioned by Penguin for the school's anthology. Um, the details are in the, uh, on the, the lecture thing on the, on the website. What's interesting here is two things, uh, I suppose, you, you would talk about. One is that it's a dramatic monologue, whereas the, Friday, the Good Friday one is a partial monologue. Dramatic, certainly, but this is a dramatic monologue. That's the one thing. The other thing is the way in which he uses voice to create the character. 
and voice and other things, obviously, comparisons and so on. But it's the quality of threat. I see uh, or I hear the hyena as a narcissist, a charming psychopath. He's coming to get us and the images bring us closer and closer to him till we're looking at his slit eyes. He's arrogant, narcissistic about, he compares himself to Africa three times. His coat, his restlessness, his, 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 um, his, his kind of power uh, that, he, that he has. And he tells us exactly what he's going to do to us. He demonstrates that first in a lion, how does he tear a dead lion to pieces? But we share the same body parts with these creatures. The, the hyena approaches the, us and leaves our bones to dry in the wind because we have feet and heart and sinews and glazing eyes. They're very, very powerful, the way that he enters into this. Um, there is, and it'll be in the lecture, a letter that he, where he describes how he went about writing that poem, which is quite interesting in itself. Now that, moving quickly in the last final minute to the final voice, which is the voice of Slate. It says in Slate, it opens, there is no beginning. Now apart from, from that, the paradox, this is the beginning poem, beginning of a series. There's a kind of mockery perhaps of Genesis or of the Gospel of John in the beginning was the word. But who are the we? We saw Lewis laid down when there was not much. And you've got an explanation of geological time but above all, you've got an exploration of this sense of intelligences which are beyond us and which convey a sense, a, dis, a sense of, I don't know, helpfulness, not admiration for us, but a willingness to, to note and to travel through the various parts of Scotland and epochs of Scotland's history and record it in voices which are, are cool and dispassionate and highly intelligent and in the end actually end up not wanting to leave Scotland. Well, a lot of people that happens when they come to see here. It's a lovely place. Now it's written in sonnet form and sonnets are usually love poems. So in one sense you could say this series of sonnets is, are love sonnets to Scotland or what is it about Scotland that makes it lovable? It doesn't, you, you know, it, 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 the weather, the, you know, the poverty, all these things are not lovable things in itself. But by looking through history and looking through time, or Wechsel der Zeiten, du Hoffnungs des Volks, that's the, that's the introduction to the series, or times that change and bring us hope. Okay, so it's about time as well. But it's that voice carried in the sonnet form saying, we can, we can be Scottish and we can do it in rhyme. We can rhyme this. We can do it with ease. We're skillful. He does it time after time after time, 51 times. That's this opening sonnet. It was about the 20, uh, it's not the first to be written. It, look up the, look up the, 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 the essay and you'll, you'll, you'll find more of it. So that's it. Right? <laughs> the big hand is pointing to <laughs> right? So I, 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 I must stop there, except that from what I've said, you can see that... I'm a, I've, can I not read the time? Is that, is that our time? Yeah, okay. Um, um, yes, it's just past it. Um, the, the, it's very easy then, if you take that thematic approach, to see how you could teach these poems and how they cohere, and you jump from one theme to the other. These themes of journeys in space-time, space-time continuity, the sense of alienation and, ide and or isolation and social coherence. So children in their teens know about these things. Okay, they see it around them. They feel it in themselves. And lastly, lastly, that sense of voices and how a poet conveys a voice and what the character is that emerges from that voice. And you can look at some of his other poems as well, um, which convey other voices. So that's it. Um, thanks very much. Thank you.